Um, welcome back, everyone. It's been a year um, to begin our 2022 20, Trans-Pacific Dialogue Program. My name is Son Jie, um, still a professor at Iwa Women's University. Uh, I will be emceeing again this year's Trans-Pacific Dialogue. Today, we have an extra special session to kick off, um, and it's an unofficial start to the Trans-Pacific Dialogue. It is a session dedicated to one of the most crucial but yet difficult relationship among the Trans-Pacific countries, that between Korea and Japan. To moderate this special section, we have one of our dearest friends, um, the Honorable Joseph Yoon, who is a senior advisor to the U.S. Institute of Peace and also the Special Presidential Envoy for Compact Negotiations. So from now on, Joe will have the mic. Joe? Uh, thank you very much, Jie. It's great to see everyone. I think many of you were here with us last year. And one of the things that we certainly noticed last year, and, and, and there's a lot of feedback on that, is a lack of a session on relationship between South Korea and Japan. So this year, we decided to put it up front, add it up front, and so we hope that this discussion will be robust. Uh, uh, certainly, I think the traction last year was, uh, by this time last year, Prime Minister Kishida had been in office only two months or so, and President Biden had been in, in office for about one year or less than one year. And then we were waiting what would happen in the Korean elections. And of course, in the Korean elections, you had elect, uh, elected uh, Yoon Suk-yeol as president. And that gave us a lot of momentum to, re to rethink the future of North Korea, I'm sorry, South Korea-Japan relations, as well as their impact on the trilateral relations. And so we have an excellent group of panelists and speakers today. And so without too much comment from me, I wanted to introduce you to Chairman Chetewon to deliver his opening remarks. Please come up to the podium. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador Joe. Uh, so it's been a year, exactly. And I remember the first meeting in here, we do have little bigger groups than last year. So uh, this is a good sign. And uh, actually today, um, welcome to the uh, special session on the Korea-Japan side. Uh, it's meaning of the world this session is, uh, what we that the world this is, uh, uh, the uh, trans-Pacific dialogue, but well, I'm, I'm trying to actually a uh, little more focus on the Korean-Japan uh, things, because as you know that uh, we do have a little trouble with it about these relationships, and uh, I think within the U.S. soul, we could have to open up the world well, these sessions, and uh, it has to much more the, uh, meaningful things. So I uh, could really invite. Uh, the Korea society and the Japan society. I heard they never get together. So uh, this is actually a good time to start with that the world is two society in the US and they could actually participate in here. And well, this is a, well, another, uh, even though it's a small step, who, who knows? It could be the much bigger, and uh, you may heard that the E. H. Carl, and uh, uh, he wrote uh, what is the history. So he said that uh, history is uh, the dialogue between the past and the future. So I try to emphasize that future this time. 
So everybody, especially the Korea-Japan relationship with this kind of past things and uh, while well, still has that kind of obstacle to improving that our relationship. But uh, if we focus on the futures and uh, uh, as you know, last year so we had a lot of discussion with it. Uh, the supply chain matters and the economic securities, and we do have a lot of uh, agenda for the uh, future collaboration. So I guess that uh, we might have that a uh, well, really good dialogue with uh, start with, and uh, we could leverage on the futures, and uh, well, we might have that there was some solution for the past too. But uh, right now, this session probably will. Uh, address that uh, where we are and uh, how we can do it and uh, what is our future future agenda and how we can actually collaborate together so uh, I think as a uh, really good revelation for that the world these uh, two nations and uh, it could much more the benefit for a trilateral relationship between the US Japan Korea too so I guess uh, this session is kind of meaningful uh, to our uh, the allied relationships uh, between the three uh, countries. I should, yeah, gratefully uh, thank for that uh, uh, the distinguished speakers and uh, Ambassador Tomita and uh, Ambassador Joe. I really appreciate you being here and the uh, contribution to the world these sessions. Thanks, thanks for the uh, joining that this session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I start by congratulating the Che Institute on following up last year's inaugural meeting with uh, the one promising to be an even greater success. It is really great to be here. Now, we are coming to the end of the year, and that reminds me of the uh, year-end tradition in Japan of choosing one Chinese character to re represent the passing year. The last year, year 2021, the chosen character was gold in commemoration of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. We are going to find out what character will be chosen this year shortly, but I'm wondering what would be an English word, just one word, to represent year 2022. There must be many ways to describe this passing year, and I'll come back with my own choice later. But looking back, you would agree that 2022 has been a challenging year. From pandemic to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there have been many disheartening news. We also witnessed some heartbreaking tragedies such as the assassination of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, or that horrendous event in Itaewon. That said, we have also seen great courage in adversity. The people of Ukraine deserve special mention here. And what about our national teams in the World Cup? For our trilateral partnership, Again, year 2022 has not been easy. Our solidarity has been tested by the repeated provocations by DPRK, and I'm afraid we are bracing ourselves for further and potentially more serious provocation in the coming month. But I also take a lot of encouragement from what we have achieved this year. As you know, during the past 12 months, our leaders met twice in trilateral format, and there have been numerous engagements at all levels of our government. Through these engagements, we deepened our conversation on our response to DPRK, which is the traditional focus of the trilateral coordination, but we haven't stopped there. We have been engaged in a broader discussions as to how we could contribute to resolving 
other regional and global challenges, as is demonstrated by the leader's statement adopted at the recent trilateral summit in Cambodia. <laughs> Incidentally, broadening, broadening the scope of cooperation is something I always advocated in my personal effort to improve the bilateral relations between Japan and Rao K. Because I always thought taking a step back and trying to put our relations in a broader regional and global context, instead of being obsessed with bilateral differences, would allow us to see each other in a different and hopefully more positive light. That somehow parochial motivation aside, having broader purposes in our trilateral cooperation is important because our cooperation matters not only for ourselves, but for the whole region and beyond. You know, sometimes we are too modest to recognize our own importance, our combined strength. Together we produce 30% of global G GDP. We contribute close to 20% to world trade. And we are responsible for 45% of global military spendings. How we should be using our strength for the global good is a question that this distinguished panel is about to address in this session. So I would refrain from going into details. But it seems to me there are three broad areas we need to be focused on. First off, security remains our core mission. And apart from the immediate threat posed by DPRK, Ukraine has reminded us that global security is indivisible. We need to step up our efforts to strengthen our deterrent and responsible capabilities, both individually and collectively. The extended deterrence by the United States continues to underpin this endeavor, but the burden must be shared by all of us. That is the reason why Prime Minister Kishida is now leading a comprehensive review of Japan's defense policy. And I also look forward to deepening our policy dialogue to ensure greater alignment of our security outlook, including threat assessments. Second, there has been increasing recognition shared by all of us about the importance of the efforts to strengthen our economic resilience and competitiveness. In this respect, much progress has been made bilaterally between Japan and the United States and between ROK and the United States in enhancing our supply chain resilience and promoting our technology leadership. Trilateral dialogue can help create synergy in these efforts, and I welcome the recent decision by our leaders to launch such dialogue. Third and finally, our three countries should be in the forefront of the efforts to build a community of nations sharing our values and principles. Here, Japan and the US will be playing a leadership role in 2023 a chair of G7 and APEC, respectively. Strengthen the engagement with our regional partners, such as ASEAN and Pacific Island countries, is also a key priority. And we share an important responsibility to lead the IPEF to an early and successful conclusion. Finally, I, I come back to the question as to what would be the word to best describe year 2022. My choice is resilience. Because I discussed, as I discussed so far, thanks to our resilience, we, we have come through the, this very challenging year with a renewed confidence in our partnership. 
we have much to look forward to in the coming year. And on that optimistic note, I conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a great pleasure for me to be uh, here in uh, Salamanda Resort to be part of the very important Trans-Pacific uh, Dialogue hosted by a Choi jong Institute. I'm very grateful to Chairman Che and also Ambassador Park for inviting me and being part, becoming part of this important conversation this afternoon. The, since President Yoon Seok Yeol's inauguration in May, we have made considerable progress in enhancing our relations with both the United States and Japan, both bilaterally and trilaterally. These developments, I hope, should provide some food for thought to further enrich our productive discussions in today's special session. I'll first begin by introducing Yoon administration's vision for the world and our relation with Japan since President Yoon was inaugurated only about six months ago. After that, I'll move on to some recent developments in this dimension and then identify some core areas we need to work on. And here I think I can probably echo many of these uh, valuable things my friend Ambassador Tomita just, just stated. Well, in August, President Yoon held a press conference on his 100th day in office. There, he was asked about his opinion on Korea's relations with Japan. To that question, President Yoon said, or asked back, is there any point in telling the past, in other words, trying to solve the problems of the past if we do not first secure a vision for the future. He then emphasized the need for close collaboration between Korea and Japan, especially given the increasingly dire security environment facing both countries. In my view, this remark succinctly encapsulates President Yoon's vision for our approach to Japan and more broadly, foreign affairs in general. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, we now live in an age of extreme uncertainty where the basic principles of international relations are being challenged. A particular case in point, of course, would be the Russian invasion of Ukraine, something that um, no one uh, would envision will happen, say, as we see. My government, of course, is acutely aware of this change in ties and has formulated a new foreign policy direction to address many challenges before us. This new approach stresses solidarity building with the United States and other like-minded countries. And together with them, Korea seeks to make greater contributions to regional and global affairs. And in, in realizing this, uh, this vision, our relations with Japan is one of the most critical pieces of the puzzle. In addition to being our neighbor, Japan is a democracy without the market economy, and we share many values and principles. Regrettably, however, our bilateral relations have suffered frequent setbacks in the past. From his campaign days, President Yoon sought to rectify this problem and committed to building forward-looking relations between Korea and Japan. He looks to the Kim Taejung Obuchi Declaration in 1998 as something that can guide our two countries into a better future, a mutually beneficial future. His approach involves 
securing consensus for better relations and restoring mutual trust so that we could address a compre comprehensive array of bilateral issues together in cooperative spirit. And my government's sustained effort to deliver on this initiative has been yielding progress, has been reciprocated by Japan. So President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida met during the UN General Assembly in September, which was quickly followed by another summit in Cambodia. In the November summit, a summit in Cambodia, as Ambassador Tomita correctly put it, President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida had a very, very positive conversation on a range of issues and agendas. Granted, the bilateral issue between Korea and Japan is a tough nut to crack. Still, all of us are confident that with trust and goodwill from both, both countries and both leaders, our dialogue in this direction will continue to make progress. And the uh, resulting improvement in our ties will undergird, will undergird future trans-Pacific cooperation, not only between ourselves, but with the United States as well. Aside from intergovernmental engagements, our people-to-people -people exchange are also making a solid recovery from the nadir of the pandemic era. Regular flights between Kimpo and Hanada airports have resumed, and Korean tourists can once again travel to Japan without visa, and also the other way around. In October this year, there were more than 410,000 air passengers traveling between Korea and Japan, almost a two and, two and a half fold jump from September. And I, I see this is an encouraging sign as a stronger people-to-people -people tie will also help stabilize our relations and, in, and provide a foundation for the improvement of the relations. In this line, with the Initiative for Future-Oriented Collaboration and Interstate Solidarity, we are also pursuing trilateral, a trilateral collaboration among Korea, US, and Japan the trilateral summit in, in Madrid in June was the first one in four years and nine months, almost five years. And last month, the three leaders met again in Cambodia and issued, as Ambassador Tomida said, for the first time, a written joint statement at the leadership level. The statement is very substantive and contain a number of important agreements. To name a few, this joint statement said the two leaders agreed to share misleading data in real time. What this means, I, I believe, is that um, Korea and Japan are going beyond a bilateral GISOMIA framework, the bilateral information sharing framework and then going into a much closer collaboration in security areas. And the other element of the joint statement I'd like to share with you is that the three leaders agreed to launch a trilateral economic security dialogue. In that way, instituting a trilateral mechanism for three countries to work together more closely in this very essential and central aspect of the cooperation between nations in today's world. As we strive to make tangible progress toward realizing the vision announced in these summits, there are two areas of particular importance I'd like to share with you. And this echoes the points made by Ambassador Tomita. The first concerns trilateral security cooperation. Amid increasingly dire security environment, especially the unprecedented level of provocation from Pyongyang, the Yoon suk yeol government has restored a number of trilateral security cooperation mechanisms. For example, the three countries have conducted an anti-submarine warfare exercise, a missile warning exercise, 
and ballistic missile search and tracking exercise. As Korean ambassador to the United States, I welcome these developments because this is a natural outcome of the, a more aligned threat perception, more aligned threat perception among the three countries. And I believe that this is important and beneficial to all three countries. Second, economic security comes to my mind as another critical element of our cooperation. After the pandemic and widespread dis disruption of supply chains, the world is turning its attention to building a stable, reliable, and resilient supply chains. Hence, I believe the time is ripe for Korea and Japan to redouble our economic collaboration under the banner of building a reliable and resilient system. Our cooperation with Japan in this front is becoming increasingly diverse and multifaceted, as seen in our joint participation in IPEF, in the Pacific Economic Co Framework, and trilateral economic security dialogue, something I mentioned already, uh, including the United States. If the three countries uh, collaborate in this spirit and see the mutual benefit that come out of this cooperation among the three countries, I believe that the problems and issues, outstanding problems, always there between Korea and Japan, between Korea and United States, but these problems, I think, be sought out and be worked out and be resolved. And I hope and look forward to a better future of collaboration among the th three countries. And um, I can tell you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that Yoon Seok-yeol government is prepared to strengthen our contribution to the trilateral cooperation among US, Korea, and Japan. And I hope that this will have a huge impact upon building a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific region, an area where Japan, Korea, and United States have huge stake in it. Finally, well, I'm participating for the first time in this a wonderful conference this year. I heard that uh, last year you have the equally a wonderful conference uh, in the United States. But perhaps in the spirit of trilateral cooperation, uh, the hosts and Che Jung Institute might consider hosting the next conference, not in the United States, but, um, but also in Japan or in Korea. And that will be a wonderful, I think, development and will benefit all of us to take a look at Japan, Korea, and have a collective experiences out of, out of this conference. At any rate, I sincerely hope today's panel discussions yield important insights into further advancing our bilateral and trilateral cooperation in the future. With that, I conclude my remarks and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Cho. Uh, I mean, I would just note that the three speakers really shared a lot of similar themes. I think uh, Chairman Che's uh, emphasis on future-oriented uh, relationship and how do we forge ahead. And then, you know, uh, Ambassador Cho Tomita followed up saying that global and regional issues should be the natural platform on how all three countries and, and you know, bilaterally as well as trilaterally can cooperate. I think the two ambassadors shared a very similar basket of issues that could be used. One is the traditional security issues ranging from shared uh, uh, perception uh, security perception vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, as well as global issues like Ukraine. And then the second issue is the economic security. And I think items like uh, Chip 4 Alliance and those will all come into play. 
Uh, somewhat unsaid is what I would imagine is the third basket, which is history issues. I mean, that's the uh, you know, biggest hurdle that the two, uh, that everyone needs to overcome. And so we'll look forward to further discussion and details on these issues. And so can I invite uh, uh, a CSIS President Hamri uh, to give us his remarks? And that will be followed by Ambassador Fujisaki and uh, former Foreign Minister Kim and Tom Byrne of Korea Society. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, you know, I, I, I looked at the topic and all of the wonderful speakers who were here, and I concluded that my role was supposed to be ornamental, but I lack any ornamental qualities. So um, let me offer one substantive comment. Before I do, I should say congratulations to the Che Institute and to Ambassador Park Incook. I say this with considerable envy. You've created quite a platform and a very needed platform, and I'm really grateful that you've You've done this. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I want to mark this. This year was really um, a very pivotal uh, in, a, in a very fundamental way that affects the three of us. And uh, it may surprise you how I say this, but um, it's derivative of our politics in the United States. Um, we, uh, we have bitterly, bitterly divided politics here. But there's one area where there are two dimensions where there's a lot of unanimity. And the first is the growing parochialism of American politics by America. You know, this is now becoming a bigger, deeper, more complicated theme here. And the second is the growing animosity toward China and the aggressiveness of trying to confront China. These are two things that frankly are bipartisan now in the United States, and they both have a, quite a significant implication for Korea and Japan. I mean, first of all, you know, you guys live right next door. I mean, you're not exactly interested in having a confrontational politics with China. You're trying to find constructive relationship with China, and we're ready to pick a fight, you know? So that's awkward. And then the second thing that's awkward is, frankly, um, we have decided we're going to wage this war on economic and technology terms. And you saw it in the landscape of this year. We had the CHIPS Act. We had the, this marvelously named Inflation Reduction Act. I would just say it's a total, you know, talk about creative labeling because it had nothing to do with inflation reduction. It had everything to do with promoting American you know, industrial foundation and put a real squeeze on our allies and friends. You guys have experienced that. Uh, and then most recently, we had the semiconductor sanctions. Okay. Now, these all fit a pattern. And it's a pattern that's going to be very typical here uh, where we're going to wage war against China on technology and economics terms, and you guys are in the middle of it. And I don't think it's a very comfortable position to be. Um, I've had many conversations with American business companies, and, uh, and some with Japanese and Korean business companies, and you know they're all very nervous about where this is going. They still want to have economic relations with China. They understand the broader dynamic, but they don't want to bifurcate the world into two alternative competing economic systems. And so um, this, is a, this is a challenge. Now, let, let me just say that I, um, the fact is that your companies want to be in the United States market for good reasons, you know. Um, it's a huge market. Um, neither of your countries has a domestic consumer base big enough to support world-class companies, you know, so you've got to be here. I understand that. But that means that you're exposed to our politics. Okay. So the question is, is how do you have a, a voice at the table before policy decisions get made? Now, I mean, I've, I've, I've listened to senior people in our administration say that we, we consulted extensively 
on the semiconductor restrictions. Usually what that means when Americans say they've consulted extensively, it means we called you the day before and told you what we were going to do, right? So how do you get a real seat at the table? I, I, I don't think there's a way to get at the seat at the table unless we create something that creates a framework for that. Now, the only existing framework for technology cooperation on an international stage is Vassenaar, but Vassenaar is broken. You know, Vassenaar won't work. Um, and Vassenaar has Russia on it, you know, so that ain't going to work. The G7 wouldn't work because Korea isn't on it. You know? The G20 is too big, and besides it has China and Russia on it, you know, that wouldn't work. I think we have to think about creating some special purpose international structures that require us, the US and Korean and Japanese companies to sit at the, or governments to sit at the table and work through policy issues together. So let me just make a humble, modest suggestion that we think about some functional structures, and I would nominate what I'd call the S5, the Semiconductor 5. And I think that would be Korea, Japan, Taiwan. That's going to be challenging. Um, the Netherlands and the United States. I think we ought to think about coming together with our own multilateral framework where we work through these things together in advance, rather than just telling you what we're going to do. I do know that the administration is desperate to try to multilateralize the semiconductor decisions that they made, and now's the time for you to use that leverage to create a framework where you have a seat at the table and you're just not on the menu. Okay, so that's, uh, I've overstated my welcome, but I did want to offer one point of substance for our conversation today, and I really look forward to hearing the conversation throughout the, throughout the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amri. Uh, that's a great suggestion. Uh, chip five, I guess. Huh? Uh, uh, and, and then, uh, can we go to uh, Ambassador Fujisaki next? Thank you. It's a great opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Institute uh, uh, Chairman and uh, President, for organizing this. I think uh, this is very innovative, and we participated last year, and I was very impressed, uh, very happy to be back here on it. Now, uh, uh, these uh, keynote speeches have to give uh, uh, some uh, food for thought, uh, and uh, but three speakers ahead of me have given so many ideas, so uh, not much left, but I'll try to give some of my ideas. Uh, I hope it's not uh, junk food, but I'll try to do something. As for Japan-Korea uh, relations, for ordinary people, it's an enigma. Why do they have to fight uh, when there's much more important things uh, and uh, are there in the world. And also, the quarrel between the two nations uh, would just uh, make adversaries happy. Uh, we all know that, but that's psychology. So it's not logic, psychology. So it's continuing. How to get out of this is uh, uh, very difficult because uh, uh, Koreans always think that, hey, why does Japanese try to spare apologies as much as possible? Japanese thinks, why do you Koreans tr move goalposts always? This is a very uh, uh, straightforwardly, the thinking, I think, on both sides. And uh, as ja uh, a Japanese feeling is that feel a bit like Iranian, if I may say. We have agreed with your previous administrations. And your opponent came and turned over everything. Is there any guarantee that this will not happen again? So. In thinking of that, what we have to do is not only legalistic agreements, but we have to change the psychology of the people. 
And for example, in Japan, Korean culture is very popular. Uh, youngsters are so much for K-pops, BTS, and everything, but that's not suffice. Because we have seen that Winter Sonata was very popular 10 years ago, but th that had some limit. What we have to do is more institutional. And I think we can learn a lot from what Americans have done. It's not a flattering, but uh, come to think of it, that you have given us a lot of good models. One, institutional uh, in economy. Japan, I, I think what, what I'm going to say is more to suggestions to Japan rather than to Korea. I think Japan should invite Korea to CPTPP. Of course, it's Korea to decide, but if there's a very cordial invitation, I think that may change, have some effect, because we still remember that when, in 1960, we were going into GATT and OECD. Europeans didn't like it, but Americans went out of their way to persuade Europeans. That's one. Second, this technology that John Hamry has just uh, suggested. I think Taiwan, Korea, is a leader in that semiconductor. I think Japan should, is now trying to look at uh, collaboration with Taiwan. I think we should look at collaboration more trilaterally and quadrilaterally. If uh, Taiwan, Korea, Republic of Korea, Japan, and United States can make a new technological quad, I think that would be very effective. And <coughs> sorry, that's point three. And maybe the area of uh, new type of uh, nuclear uh, reactor could be in that as well. Thirdly, youth exchanges. Americans have given us a good model. You have uh, done uh, American Field Service, Mansfield, or uh, uh, a lot of other exchanges that have uh, uh, brought up our young elites who are now the leaders of the country. And some of the new ones are uh, not picking up from students, but from young professionals. The young professionals would apply and carefully be selected and spend a week or two uh, together and then make alumni association. And those uh, seniors would help and share the experiences with younger people on both sides. And they are very effective. I think. Republic of Korea and Japan should try to start something, not only in students, but in young professionals under 30 or under 40, who could be leading their business and government and academia. These are things uh, maybe uh, Che Institute could uh, help as well. And Japanese, uh, I think, uh, companies and uh, governments should be thinking of. Uh, lastly, I think uh, this is not easy uh, to be said, but not too easy to be really done. But very important thing on our side is if we can have some effect on magazines and book publishers, not to uh, really uh, put out very hateful uh, magazines, columns, and uh, try to taint uh, the other side as a uh, uh, sort of adversaries. I think uh, our, in our case, uh, 
uh, our some some of our magazines are uh, very uh, uh, ineffective, uh, not useful for uh, making our relations better, and in, in Korean side maybe education. I think we have to be looking at those. But lastly, I think we have to recognize that now we are facing a golden opportunity. President Yun, is de I can see that determined to change this relation and commend his braveness in doing so. I think if we can't take this chance, we can't take the chance for long time to come. So we have to really do this now. And this is a very good occasion to discuss, not just generally, but how to help this kind of thinking in Korean side and Japanese side. And I think American uh, friends can give us a very good advice. It's not that America should be sitting, American president should be sitting in the center side with Korean and uh, Japanese leader. It's not that picture, it's something more to give us from back a wisdom like you have done before. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Fujisaki, for great comments, and especially, I think, close to Dr. Hamri's suggestion about institutionalizing many of this uh, cooperation agenda. Uh, can we now turn to uh, uh, former ROK? Thank you, Joe. Uh, this is my first uh, participation in this uh, wonderful conference. And uh, it is my honor and privilege to be speaking in front of uh, such an esteemed audience here at the second Trans-Pacific Dialogue. And uh, as this is my first intervention, I offer my deep gratitude to Choi Institute for Advanced Studies and Chairman Choi and the President Park for giving me the opportunity to share my views on the future of Korea-Japan cooperation. Uh, as Ambassador Cho mentioned three weeks ago, President Yoon and uh, Prime Minister Kishida met in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And at the meeting, the two leaders agreed to work out a swift solution to the Korean forced laborers issue, which has been a major source of tension between the two countries in recent years. I think hammering out a concrete solution will be a tough challenge. Uh, but the uh, bilateral meeting was an important step forward because both leaders demonstrated a strong desire for speedy resolution of such enduring issues. And since President, Yoon inaugur President Yoon's inauguration, Korean's perception of Japan has been greatly improved. According to a survey conducted by the East Asia Institute in September, the proportion of Koreans with a positive view of Japan rose from 12% in 2020 to 30% 30 30 this year. South Korean's perception of Japan still remains mostly negative, but a larger number of them seem to think that Korea-Japan re relations will improve under the Yoon Sung-yeol government. I believe now, Korea and Japan have a good momentum, and we need to seize the momentum and produce tangible results as we try to mend our tattered ties. Uh, there are many issue areas that can benefit from Korea-Japan cooperation. Uh, let me elaborate on four such areas. The first and foremost is the threat of North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile provocations. I don't repeat what North Koreans did this year because already uh, many previous speakers mentioned about that. Uh, one effective way of countering such provocations would be to strengthen military cooperation among Korea, Japan, and the United States. But in addition, we also need to improve bilateral security cooperation between Korea and Japan as Japan will serve 
as a rail base in the event of an armed conflict on the Korean Peninsula, responsible for reinforcements and the logistical support for the USFK and the UN forces. The second issue area for cooperation is cybersecurity. North Korea has perpetrated cyber attacks against various targets around the world over the last decade. North Korea has developed sufficient cyber capabilities to threaten the entire world. In recent years, North Korea has ratcheted up its efforts to steal cryptocurrencies to alleviate the impacts of international sanctions and fund its nuclear and missile programs. According to U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, North Korea has stolen as much as one billion U.S. dollars worth of hard currency and cryptocurrency over the past two years to fund its nuclear program. Similarly, Japan's national police identified a North Korean hacker group called Lazarus <clears throat> as the culprit behind the recent cyber attacks against the Japanese cryptocurrency funds. It is estimated that North Korea has raised about 1.6 billion US dollars from cryptocurrency hacks. So to stop North Korea from committing further cyber attacks, the international community, especially like-minded countries like Korea and Japan, needs to enhance coordination mechanisms in the field of cyber defense. The third issue area is supply chain resilience. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, global supply chains are experiencing an unprecedented level of disruptions. Both Korea and Japan are exposed to supply chain vulnerability due to their heavy reliance on imports of critical goods, especially from China. They share a strong interest in boosting supply chain resilience and could benefit considerably from close cooperation on this issue. As parties to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, Korea and Japan could deepen their cooperation under the auspices of the IPF supply chain pillar. The fourth and final issue area is domestic and global sustainability. Domestically, Korea and Japan have an aging and decreasing population, which is bringing new challenges to our two governments and the societies. And at the same time, they are also called upon to help address a range of global issues such as climate change, decarbonization, and COVID-19 vaccine development. So sharing information about policy approaches and the result could help improve both countries' ability to develop appropriate solutions. In Korea, we have a saying that goes Salt in the kitchen will make food salty only if you use it. No matter how small, there is no gain without some pains. To keep up the momentum forged by President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida three weeks ago, I propose two posts, two paths forward. First, we need to take a two-track approach that simultaneously addresses the issues rooted in history on one hand, and promote future-oriented cooperation on the other. Certainly, with the historical issues as contentious as Korea's wartime forced labor, it will take some time to bridge the differences between the two countries. So even before these issues are resolved, we should pursue cooperation between us. To start off, Korea and Japan should make it a priority to restore the general security of military information agreement, the GISOMIA, and place each other back on the trade white list. Second, we need to bring back shuttle diplomacy. Frequent exchanges of the top leaders of both governments could help put aside the long-standing distrust and discomfort between Korea and Japan and focus on developing solutions. As close neighbors and the key partners, upholding the fundamental values of liberal democracy and market economy, Korea and Japan have yet to develop the kind of relationship befitting our mutual affinity as well as our international standings. 
I think now is the time for us to build a forward-looking cooperative relationship. Renewed Korea-Japan relations will contribute to not only promoting peace and prosperity in the region, but also making the world a safer and more sustainable place for all. So thank you for... Uh, thank you very much for uh, Minister Kim's very, very wise remarks, especially on dealing with history issues and then normalizing quickly. I think, I think those are, are really good suggestions as well as four areas of cooperation. Uh, on behalf of Korea Society and Jap Japan Society, which Chairman Che has mentioned, we have invited Tom Byrne of Korea Society to give us his observations. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joe, and uh, for giving me the floor. And it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time to, um, to, to this event. And um, I have to thank uh, Pak and Gook for um, kind of urging me to, to come down and to say something about what the Korea Society is thinking of doing in this area. As you probably know, um, our work in the past has been focused, our policy work has been focused on alliance issues. The Korea Society is a strong, uh, is an advocate of a strong alliance between um, Korea and the US, um, security and diplomatic issues. Um, uh, North Korea has been prominent, human rights in North Korea too. Um, uh, cyber security and cyber hacking by North Korea, we've had a series of programs on that. Um, but we haven't done all that much on Japan. Um, from time to time we've had programs. So, um, you know, recognizing um, that the world is a more complex place now with the rise of China, it, the threat to Taiwan, um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, <clears throat> um, not just political but economic. Everyone has mentioned supply chain disruptions, supply chain resiliency. We can't forget the, uh, the rise in energy prices, oil prices, uh, the rise in global inflation, which surprised all the experts. Um, so we, um, Josh and I, Josh Walker and I, the president of the Japan Society, actually got together this summer. And we decided to, to set up um, a, a, a quarterly roundtables with the Korea Society and the Japan Society. And we would do these in the, in the first quarter this year. And we do this on an ongoing institutionalized basis and then see how it goes to see how the, um, the synergy between the organizations develop. Um, we would be focusing on new challenges um, and explore common ground and common solutions to those um, uh, challenges. Um, regionally as well as um, globally. Uh, we thought we would, um, the historical issues that have um, um, complicated the relations, to say the least, between Japan and society, we'd leave to the practitioners, experts, and scholars. And um, my idea was to uh, take a cue from the Biden Yun May summit and really focus on the strategic and economic and, and technical uh, aspects or partnerships of the alliance. So we'd be focusing also on global public health, um, uh, pandemic uh, uh, preparedness, future pandemic preparedness, of course, the um, semiconductor industry and the development of that and um, everything that goes along with that. And also um, looking at uh, cutting edge technologies and the green transition. At the Korea Society, we've already uh, done programming on that. We've developed uh, relationships with Okay. We've developed relationships with um, state level economic development agencies in Georgia, Ohio, and South Carolina. But now, um, Josh and I would like to take an international uh, focus on this. So, um, and then uh, fortuitously or serendipitously, um, Ambassador, Ambassador Kathy Stevens, who's the chair of the Korea Society, and I met with uh, Park and Guten Washington, and we talked about expanding this concept and stepping up our, of our activities, perhaps expanding the, the, the round tables, uh, taking a look into exchanges, uh, perhaps with next generation uh, scholars or practitioners, but really focus on how um, Japan and Korea, um, how they are affected by the developments in the world and to see how they would um, face these common, common uh, ch uh, challenges. So uh, this is all something new, and we're looking forward to um, 
to see where this could go, and we're looking forward to actually establishing uh, some sort of um, um, partnership between the Che Institute, um, the Japan Society, and the Korea Society. So uh, please stay tuned, and I hope we have good news for the future. Uh, progress, that is. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, well, we look forward to hearing from you and others, and especially on these projects, joint projects, uh, whether it's with Che Institute or with others on the idea of promoting exchanges. Uh, I think those were some of the items that Ambassador Fujisaki mentioned. Uh, I would like to now move to discussant. We have uh, five designated discussants. And you know, for, I would like to see them comment on three broad baskets of issues that have emerged, uh, which is security, uh, challenges, how to use that as a platform, economic security challenges, how to use that as a platform, and, and finally, what are we using it as platform? Where do we see? I think this is the question that, uh, that Chairman Che raised. You know, where are we going? Uh, what is the future outlook for, for not only uh, trilateral, but importantly, for bilateral relationship between uh, Japan and Tokyo. So let me go to uh, uh, Mira Rapp Hooper first, who is the Director of Indo-Pacific Affairs at the White House. Uh, Mira. Thank you so much, Ambassador Yoon, and thank you so much to the organizers for having me. It's wonderful to be here. This is my first time at the conference, but it is such a distinguished group and an, an honor to be among you. I will keep my comments brief this afternoon um, because so much has already been said, uh, but I will focus my brief discussion remarks on uh, the trilateral cooperation that the United States, Japan, and the Republic of Korea have been able to achieve together in just the recent past and what that tells us about where we should go with this agenda going forward. Trilateral cooperation, of course, has been of the utmost interest and priority to President Biden ever since he took office. And there are at least two reasons why that is true. The first is, of course, that in an increasingly complex and challenging security, economic, and technological environment, he believes, and we believe sincerely, that we are all stronger and safer if the US, Japan, and ROK are working together. But the second is, of course, the fact that the trilateral relationship may have a role in buttressing and helping to support ROK Japan relations um, and helping them to continue on the most productive possible path. Um, and with those motivations in mind, I'll say a little bit about where we see opportunities for fruitful trilateral cooperation. As uh, Ambassador Cho recently noted, uh, we have seen now in just the last five months two trilateral meetings between our leaders after none occurred for four years. And after the last trilateral meeting, which took place in Cambodia, uh, we laid out an agenda, which I think could keep us busy, frankly, for months, if not years to come in a trilateral context. Um, but that agenda aligns very closely with the buckets that Ambassador Yoon has prompted us to think about here. So I wanna highlight just a few items on which I think we should be particularly focused on the way forward. I'll say uh, before diving in further that, of course, uh, this trilateral agenda includes uh, continued longstanding and increasingly deep focus on the DPRK, which may indeed be increasingly necessary in the weeks and months to come. But as Ambassador Tomita rightly noted, it also includes a clear broadening of our trilateral relationship uh, in ways that give us more and more opportunity uh, with each passing meeting. And I think that's the part of the agenda which to many of us uh, is really very exciting. That broader agenda, of course, has become possible in no small part in recent months because President Yoon has sought a much more active and energetic role for Seoul in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, framing his global pivotal state concept um, and now encouraging the ROK to develop its first Indo-Pacific strategy. And with that regional strategy comes just enormous opportunity for our three countries to work together. 
First, in the security bucket that Ambassador Yoon asked us to focus on, uh, other speakers have rightly noted already the important developments achieved recently in our trilateral uh, military exercises, anti-submarine warfare, ballistic missile, um, but really demonstrable and very concrete cooperation having a happening at quite a rapid um, and important clip uh, in, in concert with the DPRK's provocations. Second, the importance of our uh, new agreement to share missile data trilaterally amongst us and to do so in nearly real time. Um, but one observation that I would make that has not yet uh, quite been foot stomped is that the trilateral coordination that is taking place within our governments on DPRK issues is so regular across all of our governments uh, that it has basically become natural muscle memory. Uh, what once upon a time seemed like an objective that we had to strive for, that is to say closer cooperation on the DPRK, has basically become standard operating procedure so that any time uh, there is a North Korean missile launch or we worry about a future provocation, our foreign policy leaderships at every level of government are in touch with one another, coordinating our policies, coordinating our statements, coordinating our sanctions if that is appropriate and relevant and ensuring that we move together in lockstep. And that's just a very important thing to recognize. Um, I would also note that the United States, for its part, takes its extended deterrence obligations incredibly seriously um, and is thinking uh, very seriously about how to continue to reinforce extended deterrence and allied assurance alongside the DPRK's continued provocations. But I would note that beyond the DPRK, I think we see some clear evidence that our trilateral alignment in the security space is increasingly moving in tandem. I would point you to the Phnom Penh statement amongst our three leaders to note that we have our first ever statement of trilateral interest in the Taiwan Strait, identifying all three of our countries seeing an interest in peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait using common language. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that this language is uh, in many ways a bridge between language that was used bilaterally between President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida in May and President Biden and Prime, uh, President Yoon in May uh, during those bilateral visits. But to have our three countries talking about peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits um, and doing so in the context of a leader level meeting is, dare say, I think a very significant achievement um, and one where I hope we will continue to have much needed conversation. Uh, second, on the area of economics, um, uh, Ambassador Cho has already spoken to us about the fact that our leaders launched an economic security dialogue, and I'll only embroider upon that to note that this is a place where we have tremendous potential to discuss many of the areas that other speakers have pointed us to here. Critical and emerging technologies, supply chain issues, critical infrastructure, conductor on semi uh, coordination on semiconductor policy, um, and coordination against economic coercion. So we have high hope uh, for this dialogue, um, and we'll count on everyone in this room to hold us accountable as we move out with this very important work in the coming months. Third, I wanted to point to another area that I think has been underemphasized um, in our conversation thus far, and that is the fact that beyond traditional security and economic security, we also have the potential to do a lot more together in the region. Um, in particular, the Phnom Penh statement points us to increasing alignment on ASEAN and in the Pacific Islands, um, where in particular, uh, we were thrilled uh, that the ROK decided to join the partners of the Blue Pacific um, and join this like-minded group of partners who will be working together to bring alternatives uh, to Pacific Island partners. And likewise, we have trilaterally committed to expanded cooperation in the Mekong region of Southeast Asia. Um, so I think and I hope that we will continue to see Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo moving as one, uh, as a regional actor in the Indo-Pacific. Finally, um, I'll just note that I think that our recent leader engagements, and again, the ROK's uh, decision to move ahead with an Indo-Pacific strategy, present a uh, set of opportunities for us that would have been very difficult to envision just a few years ago. Um, and that is the note on which our leaders ended their last uh, joint statement coming out of Phnom Penh, with a commitment to coordinating their Indo-Pacific strategies with one another in lockstep um, out into the future. Now, um, this may not not seem like a revelation, but if one were to think about where our relations stood uh, just in 2018, I think that to note that we have now committed to implementing our regional strategies alongside one another and in partnership across regional and functional areas really is a tremendous achievement. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rapp Hooper, for those 
great updates on and uh, emphasis on trilateral cooperation and projects that are on the way. Next, I would like to turn to uh, uh, former Foreign Minister Yoon young -won. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure and honor to participate in this uh, Trans-Pacific Dialogue, and I'm very glad to meet you all. I'm not affiliated to any government uh, organization uh, nowadays, so my view is purely a personal one from, our, from an uh, academician's perspective. I think after the inauguration of Yoon Song Yeol government, uh, there was a shift of focus in South Korea's foreign policy. First, values have become more important factor in foreign policy than in the case of the previous administration. Second, the US and Japan began to occupy more important positions in the minds of the key foreign policy makers than uh, in the case of the previous uh, government. Uh, of course, uh, the Yun, Yun Suk Yeol government uh, seems to be concerned about how to deal with uh, I mean, South Korea-China relations, but that seems to be qualitatively different from a diplomacy pursuing a balance uh, between China uh, and the United States. Third, uh, more emphasis was put on global diplomacy than before. Uh, for example, pursuing uh, I mean, global pivotal state instead of focusing, narrowly focusing on inter-Korean relations only. Considering various factors such as uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, intensifying U.S.-China uh, uh, competition and ever-increasing security threat from North Korea, I think uh, this was the shift uh, toward the right direction. Uh, of course, it would be a totally different matter how well they will be able to implement it. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that the domestic political base uh, supporting this kind of shift in foreign policy is still rather weak. After all, uh, President Yoon won the uh, election with only 0.73% margin. And in other words, this kind of shift of direction in Korea's diplomacy is still shaky. In other words, uh, I mean, uh, for example, considering uh, the unique characteristics of South Korean politics, that is a sort of uh, winner-takes-all system, this reasonable shift of South Korean foreign policy will probably be reversed if there is a change of political power in four years. Uh, so, I personally hope that this uh, new foreign policy direction can take root and even be institutionalized as firmly and as quickly as possible. And this is why I think corporations uh, from Japan and the United States are so uh, important and essential. For example, uh, South Korea needs to join as many institutions and networks in the West as possible. In that way, it can work together with other countries on various issues such as uh, providing international public goods and mediating the supply chain problems. It should actively join various multilateral international or networks such as uh, quad working groups, CPTPP, G7, etc especially various level uh, quad related talks uh, seems to be the best institutional framework uh, for South Korea's desire to actively pursue global diplomacy. And in this process, I hope the United States and Japan can actively incorporate South Korea. I was, uh, I mean, uh, I was uh, pleased to hear uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Fujisaki, uh, I mean, mentioning that Japan uh, should support uh, when uh, South Korea applies CPTPP. 
But about G7, I hope, uh, I mean, uh, someday South Korea can join the G7 and uh, Japan uh, fully support uh, South Korea in that case. Yun government has been trying to improve bilateral relations with Japan. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, some high level, I mean, uh, Korean officials, including President himself, mentioned that bilateral relationship sh between South Korea and Japan should pursue the second version of the Kim Dae Jung Obuchi uh, model of 1998. I strongly support that view and wish these efforts to improve bilateral relations uh, bear fruit soon. On various bilateral issues, I guess, other participants uh, I mean, will talk much. So instead of discussing very, uh, those bilateral issues, I'd like to focus on trilateral diplomatic efforts. There are so many things that three countries, uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States can do together. Uh, this summer, Mansfield Foundation held a trilateral meeting among specialists from ROK, Japan, and the United States. And after a few days of discussions, it made a few dozens of policy recommendations. Let me enumerate just three quite important and meaningful ones among them. First, hold trilateral defense ministers meeting and defense and foreign ministers meeting, that is two plus two plus two regularly. This will enhance trust, enable trilateral policy coordination and more effective response to common security threats. Second, pursue joint basic research in critical areas such as next generation semiconductors, aerospace technology, 5G, 6G communication technology, AI quantum computing. And the National Science Foundation of the United States, new energy and industrial technology development organization of Japan, and the Korea Research Foundation may co coordinate the, their efforts uh, toward uh, this direction. Third, expand people-to-people uh, -people ties, exchange programs, especially involving young people, uh, media figures, and other influencers uh, can shape and weave the fabric of community and public opinion. My, uh, fi uh, my final comment uh, 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 to the U.S. side, I mean, US, after watching us, I mean, uh, the responses uh, of U.S. allies after, uh, uh, after uh, Inflation Reduction Act, I thought that uh, U.S. government had better develop a strategy in terms of mobilizing support of allies and like-minded countries. Uh, a few uh, key policymakers of the U.S. government explained uh, U.S. strategy as invest, align, compete. The U.S. has the right uh, strategies uh, ready, in my view, in terms of investing and competing, but it doesn't seem to have developed yet an appropriate uh, strategy in terms of aligning uh, uh, allies and like-minded countries. If they can develop appropriate uh, I mean, uh, strategy in this regard, that will strengthen U.S. strategy in competing uh, China, uh, with China. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Minister Yun. Uh, it's always good to have you, but especially when you are completely unencumbered by, by positions uh, so that we can hear your views on domestic politics and, and, uh, and others. Uh, uh, I would like to now turn to Professor Park Cheri. ri uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thought uh, I, I, I speak after Nishino san but <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I think Korea-Japan relations has been troubled for just such a long, long time. And uh, I think uh, you are witnessing the slow but steady progress of the good relationship between the two countries after the UN government uh, came in. I think two things 
are encouraging the two countries to cooperate. One is a kind of a, the newly unfolding, unfolding international politics, including a Russian invasion to Ukraine and then a Chinese assertive uh, the diplomacy toward the neighboring countries, and also repeatedly suggested a, a, the increasing provocations from North Korea. So non-cooperation between Korea and Japan is not an option for us. So in that sense, we are moving forward. But, uh, but the importantly, the, the emergence of the UN government in Korea is the kind of a critical changing moment that changed the course of the, the relationship between the two countries. The UN government, I think, uh, changed the way of thinking uh, in dealing with uh, Japan in four ways. One, uh, it is trying to go beyond the past controversy, history related controversies. And we are trying to build a relationship based on future oriented uh, relationship and for the future generation. And second, we try, uh, the UN government is trying to go beyond a victim centered approach. Uh, in resolving uh, historical controversies. Talking to victims are very important, but also uh, should uh, bring in the, all the stakeholders in Korea, including the general public. That's the kind of approach that uh, the UN government is taking. The third, uh, the UN government is also trying to go beyond uh, the judicial, uh, judiciary intervention. Uh, of course, the UN government is trying to respect Supreme Court decision, but it is trying hard to find a room for executive branch's role and administrative intervention to solve the problem. So I think you, you see all the foreign ministry and other ministries' uh, efforts to solve the problem on a new platform. And fourth, uh, the, uh, it tries to go beyond the peninsula-centered approach rather than placing Korea-Japan relations to solve North Korea issue only, try to extend this, uh, the ties with the global and regional uh, uh, dimensions. This is a kind of very different approach. By, by, by way of doing that, I think we have uh, found a several common denominators for cooperation, as, uh, as was suggested by all the pre previous uh, speakers. Uh, I think uh, Korea and Japan are standing together against authoritarian revisionist countries, including Russia and China, uh, on, the, on a clear awareness that uh, Korea and Japan share a same system and same values, especially liberal democracy and market economy. So how to protect and expand uh, the liberal, econ liberal democracy and market economy is on the bit on the basis of its foreign policy. And second, the, uh, we are trying to build the trusted uh, value chains in the age of so-called the VUCA, vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and then uh, ambiguity. So the, in terms of uh, securing economic security, uh, South Korea finds that the Japan is a very reliable, uh, trusty, trustworthy partner to work with uh, uh, now and in the future at the same time. So it's a, Japan is clearly understood as a kind of partner to work with. And third, um, and the, the Korean government is working very proactively to revitalize the whole Asia and the Pacific or Trans-Pacific region. So the maintaining a rules-based international order and then Korea, Japan work together for that purpose is clearly in their minds. And, and finally, and most important for South Korea is jointly coping with the increasing and intensifying uh, provocations from North Korea. So security cooperation is the task we have to address immediately and then, uh, and then uh, and, and constantly in the future. I think, I think all this way of thinking is, is changing the nature of the Korea-Japan relationship toward the new direction, uh, which has been, we, which we didn't see uh, in the previous administration. I think in order to uh, institutionalize this cooperation further, uh, I would suggest the three things. One, as have suggested uh, in the beginning uh, by others, uh, I think uh, 
consolidating this trilateral framework of cooperation is critically important. So, so the, I, I think it's time to establish trilateral two plus two uh, to facilitate cooperation uh, between Korea and Japan. I think it's, it's much better to work in a trilateral setting to facilitate cooperation. So I think it, 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 it's, it's easier to do if you change our minds because if you try, trilateralize two plus two and then synchronize it, we can make it. Uh, and second, uh, I think uh, we cannot avoid uh, the history related controversies. We have to address it. I think the South Korean government is, taking, is making its utmost efforts to address the issue and to try to solve it. I think not only talking to victims and the victim related uh, the lawyers and then civic societies and then and submitting the letters of, of opinion to the Supreme Court and then negotiating with the Japanese counterpart of, uh, in order to uh, uh, readdress it. So I think the South Korean government is uh, on its right track and then making a slow but steady uh, progress in resolving this issue and I think the tangible result will come uh, soon. Uh, I encourage uh, the, our Japanese friend to take a kind of uh, the corresponding and reciprocal measures to facilitate uh, the, uh, the problem solving measures uh, yeah, as soon as possible. I hope uh, that measures should not be too late or too little. Uh, so I think it's a kind of in a proper manner and proper timing is very important. Finally, I completely uh, agree with uh, Ambassador Hujisaki and then Ambassador, uh, the Foreign Minister Yoon that we have to increase it people to people exchange, especially not just a kind of general public and travelers to grow up the next generation, young leaders and professionals to engage each other in a, in a, in a, in a kind of much more long-term fashion and to have the shared, shared ideas about a, the common future of the two countries. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Park. Uh, I think the number of ideas are now really emerging quite clearly. One is, and it has broad support, is institutionalizing cooperation. And second idea, especially from, from the South Korean side, is how to trilateralize more rather than less. I mean, I haven't heard that much. So let's hear from the Japanese side. Uh, let's go to uh, Professor Nishino. Thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, trilateral uh, Trans-Pacific Dialogue 2022. I really uh, appreciate and extend my uh, thanks to President Chetewon, uh, uh, Chairman Chetewon's uh, leadership, and also the President Park Ingek and other uh, Chair Institute uh, effort, people's efforts to realize this dialogue. Uh, the uh, in in uh, thank you for inviting. Uh, thank you for the uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, give give uh, my uh, give me my observation on on trilateral and bilateral relationship. First of all, I really appreciate President Yoon and Yoon Yoon administration's effort uh, to realize a second version of 1998 joint declaration between President Kim Dae Jun and the President uh, Prime Minister Obuchi. But uh, at the same time, I think that we cannot, we Japan and South Korea cannot go back to the 1998 situation. So we needed to establish new, new uh, kind of relationship between the Japan and South Korea. So I often say that uh, uh, three things uh, became bigger in our, uh, in our bilateral relationship than 20, 24 years ago in, two, in 1998. First one is the rise of China. And the second one is uh, North Korea's sophisticated nuclear and missile uh, uh, capability. And third and more importantly, the domestic politics uh, between in, in South Korea and Japan uh, is negatively uh, playing out in, in our bilateral relationship. But at the same time, we can find some uh, positive factors uh, in past 10 years. The first one is that Japan has been back uh, by uh, uh, delivering and fostering the, the free and the open in the Pacific vision. And second one is uh, South Korea uh, has become a more uh, responsible and global power uh, 
And uh, more importantly, Yun administration uh, is uh, recently delivered a uh, Korean version of Indo-Pacific uh, vision. So now uh, we, Japan and South Korea, uh, has, uh, have a very uh, wide diplomatic room to cooperate more in the past period. But uh, still, uh, to do so, uh, we need to restore our trust relationship. So to restore our trust between Tokyo and Seoul, I think the, uh, we need a more frequent uh, strategic dialogue. Uh, hopefully, the two plus two formula, defense and the, uh, for, uh, foreign and the defense uh, ministerial uh, level. So in this, in this uh, strategic dialogue, uh, the focus uh, should be on first to uh, foster mutual understanding uh, about the each security and the foreign policy. So now, the, as Japan is the, uh, revising our security uh, policy, uh, national security strategy, and also the UN administration is enhancing its uh, defense effort. So these uh, defense policies uh, may destabilize our bilateral relationship. So we needed to understand each security and the foreign policy. And second, uh, we needed to uh, narrow the perception gap, especially on, uh, on China and uh, uh, Taiwan issue. So the, I, 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 know, I know that now the, there is the growing the criticism and the pessimism on China in South Korea, but still we, Japan and uh, South Korea, uh, see differently uh, uh, their relationship with China. So we needed to uh, narrow this gap. And third one, uh, we needed to uh, prepare a kind of joint, new, new joint vision if we really pursue the second version of the uh, Kim uh, Obuchi Declaration and also to cultivate our areas of cooperation. So, the, uh, so these are really uh, prerequisites to uh, foster our bilateral and, and the restore our bilateral ties. So far, uh, we've seen the uh, activation of trilateral formula among the United States and South Korea and Japan. And uh, uh, I think the trilateral formula should be more focused on the uh, three uh, areas. First one is the North Korea policy. Uh, so far, uh, I think that uh, our trilateral coordination uh, put more emphasis on defense and deterrence side. But at the same time, I think that uh, we need more, uh, in a way, comprehensive North Korean policy. Because the now South Korean uh, domestic politics is, is quite polarized. And uh, to, to realize more sustainable North Korea policy, uh, bi bipartisan support is really needed, especially in South Korea. So to do so, more comprehensive uh, North Korea policy is really uh, desirable. And the second one is the uh, uh, supporting and, and uh, developing the existence order in this region. Uh, so the, as already mentioned in previous, uh, uh, by previous speakers, uh, IPF and the CPTPP and uh, is quite a desirable uh, platform to develop this uh, sustaining, sustain and develop uh, the existing order in this region. And uh, also the supporting the capacity building in ASEAN countries and also in so-called global south is really uh, needed. And we, Japan and South Korea and the United States uh, can work together more on, in this field. And also the economic security is quite important, especially the, between uh, Tokyo and Seoul. Uh, we have a very strong uh, supply chain and we need to pro protect this uh, supply chain in the near future. And lastly, the, uh, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that the sustainability is quite important, not only in trilateral formula, but also in bilateral uh, relationship between Tokyo and uh, Seoul. So to uh, ensure sustainability, uh, institutionalization of trilateral formula is quite uh, important. And uh, uh, regarding bilateral uh, ties between Japan and South Korea, uh, the Japanese side always concerned about the, in a way, the 
uh, fragile domestic politics in South Korea, and we really uh, afraid of the, uh, I'm sorry, but the change of government in South Korea every five years. So the, I, re I really hope that the Yoon administration uh, make his effort to form national consensus in, in, restoring and, in restoring bilateral ties between Tokyo and Seoul. And uh, I really uh, want to see uh, the joint new vision uh, between Japan and, uh, Japan and South Korea in the near future, uh, hopefully in 2025, which is 60th anniversary of the, our bilateral relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nishino, for those very useful ideas, especially on getting more consensus in South Korea. I think uh, you, you know, I'm sure we all wish the same. Um, uh, can, the last speaker will be online, and I think you can see her except for us on this side, you know? Uh, and so our last speaker is a uh, <laughs> member of the House of Councillors, uh, Rui Matsukawa. Uh, Ms. Matsukawa, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, and honor to participate in this meeting, but it's a bit regrettable because I have to just be online. Uh, and I see more, uh, many familiar faces uh, from my days in uh, Seoul as a diplomat. And currently I'm a politician. And uh, as uh, all mentioned by the previous speakers, I do think, and we do, uh, actually I, I represent most, not all, but some major a part of the Japanese public sentiment. I, I do think that we see the golden opportunity uh, for the improving the relationship between Japan and South Korea under the Yun uh, Son Yeol government. Unfortunately, uh, under the Moon Jae-in government, our relations has been deteriorated to the worst in the history. Uh, from Japanese perspective, Moon Jae-in, uh, under the Moon Jae-in government, one after another, the historical issue, uh, which has been already resolved in the 1965 agreement, has been unilaterally reopened by the South Korean side. But I, I, I we really appreciate and, and, and commend that the um, President Yoon Son yeol himself seems to be really committed to uh, uh, the necessity for improving the relationship, bilateral relationship with Japan. He has been very consistent. And unlike Moon Jae-in uh, government, uh, uh, President Moon Jae-in, I think young government seems to, uh, to share the uh, basic uh, notion of threats uh, regarding the North Korea and China, which is really important because that will be the basis for any possible uh, security cooperation. And thus, I, I do see, see the many uh, prospects for the Japan, South Korea, U.S. trilateral security cooperation. And the secondly, I think Pres Yun, President Yoon, a Yoon government, has a larger perspective on security, not limited to the uh, Korean Peninsula, but to the, um, uh, let's say, Indo-Pacific at large. Uh, and then I, I appreciate that the, uh, the South Korea issued the in free and open Indo-Pacific uh, uh, report uh, in uh, November the 11th, and, and in this respect, I really would like to, to point out that there are a couple of the things that uh, maybe the, we can focus and, and further uh, pursue. One is, I think, the Taiwan peace and stability in Taiwan uh, Straits, um, including the the South Korean uh, involvement in possibly deterring the possible Taiwan crisis is really important. I think many Japanese people now do under, do have the recognition that Taiwan crisis will be most likely the Japanese crisis. Well, Yonaguni Islands is only 100 kilometers from the Taiwan. So when Taiwan is military uh, violated, uh, it will be the Japanese uh, uh, cases also. But considering the sea lane, our Japan is island country in, in South Korea is a peninsula, but both of us also share the same sea lanes. Uh, Middle East oil comes from the Malacca Straits and then back going through the Taiwan Straits or the Pacific Straits to, to each of our countries. So protecting the sea lane is really important. And then I think the, our 
peace and stability of Taiwan directly affects our security, our means, not just Japan, but South Korea as well. And so uh, I think it is a very important agenda for uh, Japan, South Korea, and, and of course, U.S. mostly, uh, is to share the uh, uh, what if we will do in the cases of Taiwan crisis or what how we should do to deter uh, that happens. It's a really important agenda that I do expect. And, and then the other thing is the... Um, our, um, the um, of course, DPLK is the easy one. Uh, I mean, uh, we have clear our, not just Japan and, and, and South Korea, but of course the US. I mean, we three countries share the clear interest in, in, our, our, in, the, in defending ourselves from the DPLK's uh, threats. So I appreciate that recently our three countries' leaders agreed to, um, to have the real time sharing of the uh, information regarding DPLK missiles is, uh, I think, a progress and we can pursue more uh, developments in this regard. And then I think, uh, secondly, I would like to point out not just Japan and South Korea, or Japan, South Korea, the US, which is very important, and, but I think we can explore many other frameworks like the Japan, South Korea, and Australia, and New Zealand had a meeting as a NATO partners. Uh, uh, and we can think about many uh, creative ways to um, have a many layers of dialogue, which is, I, I think, can contribute to um, institutionalize the, our bilateral relations. And unfortunately, I share the view that, you know, well, if South Korea is a dynamic nation, and if the government changes from the conservative to liberal or liberal to conservative, then the gap of the policy posture is pretty large. So institutionalization of the framework is really important. So I agree with the um, uh, Professor Pak Cho Hee that uh, we can maybe think about two plus two plus two. And so U.S. can play a role to sort of um, hug the relations, Japan-South Korean relations in a managerial, uh, you know, the frame uh, by, uh, I think, establishing two plus two plus two, or maybe uh, we create, as I mentioned, some other framework like Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, or New Zealand. In many ways, I think we can institutionalize our relations. And thirdly, I also would like to echo the importance of the people to people's relations. And of course, use to use uh, relations or leaders to leaders or foreign minister to foreign ministers, of course, very important. And also as a politician, I would like to um, point out that the um, politicians I mean, the parliamentarians to parliamentarians relations also needs to be strengthened. And not just like our old, our important persons, but I think the younger politicians or middle class politicians and many ways, I, I think it's very important to have the communications. I'm thinking about visiting the uh, Seoul uh, next January and myself uh, together uh, to have uh, uh, to make friends, basically, and then drinking sake or drinking, you know, the alcohol, or drinking the drinking the, and, and then making the fest doesn't make problem gone. And but I think it's really important to have the uh, relations to, to talking terms uh, between the politicians uh, is very important. And with the same line, I do think it's really important to have the shadow diplomacy. Uh, leaders to leaders meeting uh, the summit uh, between Pre uh, President Yoon and uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, was a very successful one. I think they established a good human, uh, good personal relation. Um, uh, Mr. Park Chin, uh, my know too, uh, it has established a good uh, personal relations, and these things is really important. So uh, with these lines, I stop here. But again, I think the. Japan and South Korea needs to realize and then scratch as much as possible that our geography locations, uh, Fukuoka and Busan is only three hours by ferry and wouldn't change forever. And I think other than the historic issues, Japan and South Korea, the, you know, democracy, uh, free democratic countries, uh, 
having the U.S. the most powerful and democratic leader as our ally has no reason to um, have a bad relations other than history, which is a psychological um, problem not rather than a substantial problem. And I, I really hope that uh, with young government, uh, we two uh, countries need to make utmost efforts to go as far as possible to um, make our relations stable and, uh, well, no setback for any other time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've now come to the end of the session. And uh, just one comment from me would be that many of you have talked about uh, Kim Dae-jung Obuchi agreement as being the highlight. And that was 25 years ago. So to me, it is a little, uh, a little jarring to talk about that it's been a little bit of downhill for 25 years. However, at the same time, we have to be somewhat somewhat enthusiastic, optimistic, that there are so many platforms that we can use uh, to improve relations. And uh, I appreciate Ambassador Park Gin-guk's remarks about, you know, Korean private sector playing a role uh, in, in these exchanges. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr.